articulate and close follower of climate politics for uh, uh, over uh, 20 years that he has been uh, engaged with the subject. So without uh, much ado, let me uh, move uh, quickly into the subject of the discussion. The first point is, uh, before I uh, enter into the talk, perhaps a word is in order regarding the title. Uh, the desire was to keep a somewhat neutral stance uh, in raising uh, the issues and hence the word uh, horizons, which uh, I felt was somewhat uh, neutral. My natural preference would, of course, have been challenge, but uh, I decided to give that a miss. There were qu questions uh, uh, raised informally uh, about those who saw the title, whether this was too positive uh, uh, title, but I leave that uh, to you to decide as we continue. So, so I want to begin by quickly laying out some of the context in which COP27 took place. So one is, of course, the larger uh, general political context. One is, of course, uh, the first is, of course, there is a particular significance to the uh, to a conference of parties of the UNFCC being held in a developing country, particularly in Africa. It may be recalled that uh, Egypt, the COP presidency of this COP27 is a partner of uh, India and some other countries, including China, Bolivia, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, etc., in the uh, LMDC, the like minded developing countries, also member of Arab group, etc. So, this had a particular resonance in the uh, fact that the COP was held here. It also brings its own challenges that I'll come to uh, later on. The context of uh, uh, COP27, of course, takes place uh, in the midst of uh, heightened concerns about energy and food security. Food security in uh, key, in important uh, and significant uh, areas in the global south uh, due to the conflict in Europe. And the second is a major impact on energy security that affected particularly the developed countries, uh, most notably in Europe, but the effects have been felt all over. So this was the another very important uh, part of the context, which was quite a shift from the uh, scene we had prior to COP26. The third point uh, for, of the context, which is related to the second, is that in this period, because of the impact on energy security, and even somewhat independently, if one may say so, because it predated the conflict, immediately after, post, after COP26, there was a significant ramping up of oil and gas uh, in terms of uh, bringing back capacity that was offline and uh, developing, in fact, new capacity by the developed countries with uh, long-term implications. So despite the uh, rather high rhetoric of uh, uh, e uh, the European Union in particular at COP26, uh, there has been, prior to COP27, widespread global criticism of the backsliding by developed countries. So this was another significant part of the backlog. Uh, the fourth point, and this of course had a very significant influence on what actually directly transpired at COP27, was that at least on one aspect of the climate change issue, namely uh, facing up to loss and damage 
and the clear recognition that climate change is exacerbating uh, uh, climate extremes and their impacts are leading to uh, loss and damage. The attribution of loss and damage from such extremes to uh, climate change, uh, particularly anthropogenic global warming, the evidence is mounting. So there was really a chorus from global public opinion demanding action on loss and damage. So these uh, were some of the background features as we went to COP27, as all the countries came there. Uh, uh, another very, uh, perhaps I think it would be an appropriate point for me to be, uh, shall we say, in the interests of full disclosure, uh, to make the point that uh, I was indeed a member of the uh, Indian uh, official delegation to COP26, the government delegation, as a technical member. Uh, uh, however, my views today are, uh, uh, of course, informed by my work with the government, but should not be taken as the uh, any authoritative or uh, semi-authoritative uh, statement uh, of the government's uh, views on the matter. So this is a talk on my own responsibility. Okay, moving on. So the other very important thing to the background of COP27 were the scientific assessments that came from the IPCC's uh, two reports of Working Group 2, which deals with adaptation, and Working Group 3, which uh, deals with uh, mitigation. Uh, both of these appeared, uh, were uh, approved uh, by uh, the full IPCC panel, these uh, reports, and the uh, governments that are members of the panel approved the corresponding uh, summary for policy makers. So these provided very important uh, scientific input to COP27. So I will quickly summarize some of the key highlights, including that of working group one. The first is the, uh, uh, the role of the global carbon budget that limiting carbon dioxide emissions to the appropriate global carbon budget is the key to keeping temperature rise to the desired limit. So it is not just net zero because a budget implies that eventually emissions should reach zero. Uh, it cannot be only peaking because peaking by itself uh, does not guarantee that uh, it reaches zero or it stays within the budget. So the budget is the term that uh, puts together all of these aspects and limiting, keeping to the limit of the budget is the key to limiting temperature rise to the Paris goal. Another very important aspect of working group two uh, and to perhaps a lesser extent three, but it was also there in very, very much, is a major emphasis on equity and climate justice. Uh, the equitable sharing of the global carbon budget as global commons as the key to implementing equity was referred to, though perhaps certainly not central, but certainly referred to. There was explicit recognition of large differences in cumulative emissions of developed and developing regions. So historical responsibility in the sense of the disproportionate uh, taking up of the global carbon budget by some by the developed regions of the world was explicitly referred to and quantified in the IPCC Working Group 3 report. It also transpired that uh, for the first time, it emerged with some clarity that modeled the global mitigation pathways, however, in the IPCC are not based on equity or the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Uh, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Tejal Kanetkar and uh, our, uh, her student, Akhil Maitri, uh, 
we have done some further uh, analysis and perhaps this is something we can discuss in uh, uh, discussion time but the main point is that these scenarios uh, actually perpetuate the north south inequalities across most variables and indicators well to the end of the century nevertheless the ipcc report itself acknowledged that equity was not an input uh, the very important uh, part was played by the recognition in working group 2 and in a slightly uh, perhaps modified fashion uh, the role of uh, the recognition of the role of public finance as a critical uh, enabler for climate action especially adaptation and this is very well reflected in the cop 27 decision as we shall see uh the another point uh, that uh, it uh, which is of great relevance to developing countries is the uh, clear statement in working group 2 that the reduction in vulnerability to the impact of climate change in the medium term uh, meaning up to 2050 has far more to do with socio economic development than the differences between emission scenarios so the bottom line is development matters now this is simply a selection of results some of which are key to what i will talk about but there are many more in this vein and uh, those who have not i would encourage uh, uh, readers to those uh, who have not to pay greater attention to the summary for policy makers of this report uh at the before we talk of uh, uh, cop 27 itself i would like to spend uh, uh, a few minutes talking about a very important development which is the submission by india of its uh, uh, long term low carbon development strategy i won't use that uh, full term it's a mouthful i shall refer to it as lts the long term strategy after the national statement at cop 26 that declared net zero by 2070 and india's updated nationally determined contribution submitted in august 22 india became uh, the one of 60 countries the 59th or 60th to join those who have submitted a long term uh, no emissions development strategy as it is formally known in the unfcc uh, language india's lts and this is very important is based on four aspects one is the pursuit of development goals according to national circumstances while keeping within its fair share of the global carbon budget the second aspect is the need to meet its significant energy needs for development uh, the question of uh, uh, the source of energy is a different issue from the fact that uh, energy is one of the primary requirements uh, for development in its material dimension and the third is india's commitment to the pursuit of low carbon pathways for development despite the fact that its uh, contribution to uh, global warming has been minuscule i can just quickly remind you that all of southern asia which is 25% of the global population or 24% maybe uh until 2019 was responsible for less than 4% of uh, cumulative emissions so this is uh, a very important uh, fact to keep note of uh, co2 emissions the fourth point uh, which uh, uh, aspect which is essential to india's lts is the need to build climate resilience okay uh the lts lists the key elements of the transition to uh, 
to low carbon development pathways across six major sectors including finance and other means of uh, implementation uh, it dis meaning it discussed that in a separate seventh section uh, because uh, without the means of implementation uh, achieving all the elements of the transition would be very difficult uh, I will explain this a little more in just a minute. Uh, and uh, uh, I am fine. Yes, uh, the key elements that are listed uh, of the transition uh, provide, I think, uh, ambitious, challenging agenda. Uh, critics may think it is perhaps even uh, over ambitious, uh, while others would be enthusiastic about it. Uh, it is, however, true that the details of this have still to be thought through, and uh, which was uh, an agenda which was the product of an ex uh, extensive uh, consultation process. Uh, what I would like to focus on is to draw your attention not just to the uh, not just to the uh, details of these key elements. It's available on the website of the UNFCC. Uh, it would, I think, be uh, useful for all of us to read it through in uh, detail. Uh, the first point I would like to make about the LTS is one key message, one set of key messages relates to equity. Equity is a fundamental principle, uh, says the LTS, to be implemented through access to India's fair and equitable share of the remaining carbon budget. And uh, developed countries uh, must be accountable for their overuse uh, of the global carbon budget uh, historically, either through uh, physically, through implementing negative emissions, or through provision of uh, the means of uh, implementation. You know, in terms of finance, technology transfer, etc. Uh, uh, the very important point about this claim to a fair share of the carbon budget is that India makes clear that its mitigation actions are not an invitation to developed countries for free riding. Meaning that uh, if India reduces, avoids uh, emissions that it would otherwise have undertaken, the benefit of this must accrue to India. It cannot be that then it absolves uh, developed countries of the level of their proportionate uh, emissions reduction and uh, allows them to uh, and uh, allows them to uh, take it up. Uh, you know. Uh, slow down their actions even, or, uh, you know, take a, uh, uh, continue to take a disproportionate share of the global carbon budget. Uh, and in this light, proactive low carbon innovation and development is not a choice, but a necessity, especially if India is to progress well beyond its lower middle income status. Uh, the second set of messages are about uh, transition. Uh, you know, the uh, unlike developed countries, transition, the term as it is used, in the developing country context is not about decarbonization or immediate decarbonization. It is transition to low carbon pathways of development. This is uh, well articulated in the LTS, I believe. Uh, rational use of fossil fuel resources will be part of this strategy, a strategy that must also ensure poverty eradication, including achieving the SDGs as a, a minimal aspect of it, and also ensure food and energy security for the future. 
Research and innovation have a critical role to play at this stage of the evolution of our long-term strategy. Progress, as noted in the minister's foreword, uh, quite uh, put very well. Progress along this, uh, in implementing this strategy, will depend on technology development, uh, the state of the global economy, and international cooperation with many potential risks that are yet to be fully understood. So the point I would leave you with is that access to a fair share of the carbon budget and an ambitious low carbon development strategy are not two different framings or two different uh, framings of the question of two equity, but two complementary aspects of the same framing. So to turn to COP27, and this is, I think, uh, the introduction to India's LTS was important. Before uh, uh, talking about COP26, it was always important for us to refer to India's national statement at COP26 delivered by the Prime Minister in the context of uh, COP27, India's LTS uh, was a significant uh, event. So uh, what happened at COP27? So to my mind, the way to read, uh, you know, many things happen at a COP. There are a very wide range of uh, uh, decisions. They cover uh, things which are in process. They are cover discussions that come to conclusions. Decisions are taken. So, you know, sometimes it is hard to even for uh, someone like me with a little experience of this to keep track of the threat. So, to my mind, there were two significant threats to COP27. The first was uh, the continuing push by developing countries to move away from a mitigation centric agenda. The acknowledgement that a safe and livable world must also be an equitable world that permeated uh, the uh, discussions uh, and especially emphasized by the developing world in a manner that the global north could not quite, uh, could not, uh, quite ignore. It was also driven by a strong G77 plus China coordination with Mr. Mouster has already referred to, which was uh, highly significant. And uh, even if the developed countries had uh, mounted uh, quite significant opposition to any overt mention of equity, and uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, this opposition could at least in part be bypassed in actual decision. The second aspect, and uh, these are the two horizons that I refer to in the title, the second aspect, the second thread, as it were, uh, is more, shall we say, complex and uh, evolving. It is marked by also quite strong contestation. But uh, there is a forward movement on implementation and climate action, which uh, typically actually means uh, mitigation. Uh, it is a challenging thread for uh, uh, developing countries. Uh, but I think they were very su quite successful in demanding uh, fairly uh, vocally that developed countries must walk their talk on this. Uh, however, this uh, in this thread of discussion, there are new pressures on the bioresources of the third world as the site of mitigation to enable slower uh, transition in the global north. So let me deal with the uh, first aspect, the beyond the mitigation agenda, of which the most uh, prominent one was first for the success on loss and damage. Uh, uh, the satisfaction over it is justified. 
that despite the decision to establish a funding facility, we all recognize that funding will be uncertain and negotiations will be difficult and contentious. Uh, attempts will be made to, uh, to draw all G20, especially China and India, into uh, the funding arrangement. India, of course, is already making some contribution to the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, but uh, that is voluntarily done, and uh, to make it a requirement was very much part of the COP20 uh, or COP27 uh, agenda. Uh, nevertheless, despite all these pressures, I think the overturning of the Paris decision text that implicitly rejected responsibility for loss and damage was one of the outstanding achievements of the decisions on loss and damage. The COP27 decision firmly establishes a link between warming and loss and damage. While the science of uh, uh, the sixth assessment report established the link between warming and responsibility through cumulative emissions. So I think uh, responsibility for loss and damage is on the agenda. Uh, whether it will take a legal form, uh, we can see. But uh, this very fact is, uh, I think, of great importance. Uh, not much has been written in the media, I find, uh, on finance, but uh, the one of the things I'd like to point out today, there was the enormous progress which was made on the contentious terrain of finance. This is not to say that the money is flowing. I mean, that we recognize that there is an issue, but uh, 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 in terms of... Uh, uh, underlining the need for finance and uh, what kind of finance, on what terms. COP27 has um, uh, some very important decisions. One is continuing expressions of concern, if not uh, regret as in Glasgow, on the lack of delivery uh, of the promised uh, 100 billion per annum. The uh, but the really landmark, uh, one landmark uh, uh, inclusion in the cover decision in terms of finance is for the first time an explicit cost estimate for the scale of mitigation and transition finance that is required has been put down. Four trillion per year uh, until 2030 for renewables and four to six trillion per year for the low carbon transition. Uh, these are estimates from the IEA, the International Energy Agency. Uh, our experience with scenarios suggests that these would be very inequitably estimated if you drill down to the regional distribution, probably even an underestimate, but nevertheless, putting a figure on the table is an important begin. The other uh, uh, aspect, and uh, you must excuse my over-enthusiasm in uh, uh, listing the uh, uh, decision in full, is uh, para 34 of the deci main decision cover text that emphasizes the acceleration of financial support. It talks about uh, its criticality to enhancing uh, climate action. It talks about uh, addressing inequalities in access to finance, terms and conditions. And it, above all, underlines that scaled up public grants for mitigation and adaptation for vulnerable regions would be cost effective and have high social return. This is a real reversal of the emphasis on moving towards private finance in Glasgow. And this is really echoes uh, uh, quite a bit what the IPCC Working Group 2 had put out. 
Uh, para 37, uh, in fact, uh, has uh, even more interesting uh, point uh, which calls on the my MDB, the development banks and financial institutions to reform uh, multilateral development bank practices and priorities, align and scale up funding, ensure simplified access and mobilize climate finance from various sources. But it goes on further to talk about encouraging uh, these banks to define a new vision and commensurate operational model, instruments that are fit for purpose, and so on and so forth, taking note of uh, an emphasis on grants and non-debt uh, instruments, and taking into account debt burdens of developing countries. Now, you, uh, the, certainly many of you would recall that uh, the reform of the global financial architecture is something that has been uh, put out uh, for debate very often by the major uh, economies among the developing countries. So here is a decision that even if the scope of fin climate finance were to go outside the UNFCC framework, and there was some justified concern, but the call here is to do it on terms that speak very much to the idea of reforming the global financial architecture. So I think this is not a settled issue. This will be contested in the years to come, but this is I believe, a very important development. On the question of implementation, of course, we had much stronger pushback from developed countries on the question of equity. Uh, there were several attempts in the covered decision to provide a special status to the Glasgow Climate Pact, which were uh, quite strongly rebuffed by developing countries. Mr. Mouskar quite uh, rightly referred to how Sharm el Sheikh is called the implementation plan uh, and Glasgow, the climate pact. And there was uh, clearly a concerted attempt to elevate this quote unquote pact to the status of the Paris Agreement. But uh, uh, I do believe that uh, there is little ground on this that was ceded by developing countries. Uh, the second periodic review of progress towards the long-term goals of the convention, a review process that was to focus on uh, how parties have lived up to their commitments under the convention, especially uh, prior to the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement having begun only in 2020, uh, ended with unfortunately a weak decision it substantially ignored the most significant aspects in this regard of the IPCC sixth report uh, assessment report findings. But uh, one may say that perhaps it was a bit of a uh, stalemate that uh, this, there was uh, much potential in this, but we have to uh, perhaps look at the global stock take to recover what developing countries wanted from the second periodic review. Uh, India, of course, had a strong stance on this, but the appetite from uh, G77 and China was considerably less for a strong push on this. Regrettably, one of the uh, unfortunate uh, uh, Outcomes is a covered decision that pushes through nature-based solutions, uh, something which did not happen at Glasgow, but it is in highly uh, qualified form with caveats and uh, with the alternate term ecosystem-based approaches. Uh, it refers to the United Nations Environmental Assembly Resolution of March 2022. That has further caveats. But uh, typically, such openings are used by developed countries, multilateral financial institutions, and NGO donors to mount pressure on developing countries. 
uh, on the closing day, India's uh, minister, uh, Sri Bupender Yadav, made it very clear that, uh, uh, you know, we are not in the framework for, uh, uh, framework, uh, uh, we don't understand nature-based solutions as a solution to climate action. The key lies with uh, the key lies with emissions uh, reduction. Uh, can I just use this opportunity to call my colleagues in the next room uh, to come and help me with something? Uh, I will continue. Meanwhile, uh, uh, unfortunately, also there are multiple references to conserve, protect, and restore natural resources. Ignoring even the term sustainable use, uh, which is used in the uh, UNEA resolution. Yes. Uh, in fact, it is very surprising that uh, the decision text on water that, uh, uh, you know, is uh, water being clearly one of the key components uh, sustainable use of water being a key issue in uh, uh, adaptation in the form of irrigation, etc., is, uh, uh, you know, uh, water is noted there, but without the term sustainable use, a term which is actually present even in the UNEA uh, resolution. Uh, one of the really uh, uh, highly contested decisions of the uh, uh, of COP 27 was uh, at uh, COP uh, was on agriculture. Developed countries made it clear that their interest in a joint work program uh, on uh, climate action in agriculture and food security meant actually mitigation. Uh, this uh, India made it clear, and so did the bulk of the G77, that this targeted a significant global population of small and marginal farmers of the South uh, who have contributed the least to warming but will bear the brunt of climate impact of the future. So India had to, India worked very carefully with G77 plus China to incorporate uh, several caveats and options to ensure that the decision does not provide a blanket mandate to mitigation in agriculture. Nevertheless, India pushed for further ring fencing smallholders from mitigation burdens. Many of you would recall the press statement of 18th November issued uh, uh, by the delegation in very strong terms. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, the uh, the other uh, uh, major issue was on the question of fossil fuel. Uh, about whether the, it should be the phase down of all fossil fuels, uh, going back to India's original uh, suggestion at COP26. Uh, uh, my colleague messages me that I am running out of time, so I'll just take about three minutes. I am very close to uh, finishing. So uh, many of you are aware of this, perhaps this is, of course, uh, was documented in the press. I think there is uh, uh, the European Union, uh, somewhat surprisingly to some observers, said it would back India. But unsurprisingly to many of us, it also said that it would uh, uh, back the uh, language only if the original emphasis on coal was uh, retained from COP26. Uh, developing countries are, were also partly concerned, especially those hugely dependent on oil and gas for their economies. Uh, but uh, 
uh, India in a spirit of compromise and uh, uh, concerned with uh, developing countries' unity, uh, 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 finally uh, did, uh, uh, you know, accept the language uh, of uh, the Glasgow text. But uh, this question of a principal stand, I think, uh, is something that needs to be further elaborated in discussions within the G77 plus China. Uh, there is certainly, and this also Mr. Mouster referred to, there was this sneaky, and I mean the term sneaky is really justified, this last minute intrusion of the term low emissions along with uh, renewable energy uh, as one among the means to reduce emissions. And this is so openly a pandering to gas use in the global north that uh, there is no need for further discussion. Uh, enhanced ambition and just transition, the UNFCC has begun uh, the work program on the first. There will be a work program on the second. On this, India made clear, uh, including in the closing, uh, 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 made it clear that uh, uh, just transition uh, uh, for develop, uh, developing countries is low carbon development and not decarbonization. Uh, one should be, I should just correct myself uh, here, India's principal stand was uh, on the face down of all fossil fuels with the lead being taken by developed countries. Now that of course is anathema to developed countries. So that was that. Uh, but the overall picture you get in the mitigation, and uh, though it was not as uh, uh, full-throated as it was at COP26, but nevertheless, uh, there was considerable pressure, is this constant attempt to change goalposts by the developed countries. Drowning developing countries in a barrage of words, in meetings, in reports, in reporting requirements, monitoring arrangements with little or no support forthcoming. So uh, this is uh, still, unfortunately, uh, the name of the game in mitigation. So I will be uh, brief about India at COP26. We can discuss some of this. Uh, India was uh, stood completely by uh, G77 plus China, and on all the major gains, uh, India was a party to uh, their success. India's vision uh, articulated in the LTS was deployed in our negotiations as well. And one very important point I wish to highlight is that for uh, India increasingly, Equity is no longer merely a shield or a sword. There was this celebrated phrase which said that India used the, the equity as a shield and not a sword. But here, you know, growing realization, perhaps increasingly shared in the world, especially by civil society, is neither shield nor sword, but a fundamental principle for a safe and livable world as a positive requirement and not a defensive strategy. India also actively pushed the agenda of life for a world of uh, sustainable production and consumption, moving to sustainable lifestyles, uh, a subject on which the Prime Minister has uh, been very articulate and vocal. And this has been handsomely acknowledged in the preamble to the cover decision. At the closing plenary statement by uh, the Minister for Environment, Sri Bupender Yadav, who led from the front throughout the uh, two weeks of uh, negotiations, articulated India's measured response and pointed cautionary statements on key issues. So here's my concluding assessment. Uh, first is that uh, there must be considerable sympathy 
for a third world country holding a COP that sees it as an opportunity to advance the cause of developing countries, especially from its own region. So to call it a monumental failure, to call it the worst of all COPs, uh, really, I think, is uh, wanting in uh, uh, this empathy, which uh, certainly I don't think uh, is part of the government's official view and certainly not uh, uh, anyone's uh, personal view, that who, especially those acquainted with the negotiation. Uh, it is very important uh, uh, that we must uh, emphasize that uh, uh, if there were, uh, uh, apart from the highlights that I have discovered, many key developing country concerns were uh, echoed for the first time in the cover decision. Food security, vulnerability of food production systems, and the right to uh, help uh, etc. Uh, the language in uh, Sharm el Sheikh is much stronger than that of COP26. So these are uh, elements that we can build on for the future. So some of them, as we saw in the agriculture decision, could also turn out to be a double-edged sword. But uh, that, of course, one has to face in the future. Uh, this was a major platform for loss and damage, adaptation and finance, though adaptation uh, landed in something of a stalemate. But uh, nevertheless, this was uh, a high level of articulation by a united G77 and China. And this COP was no mitigation centric COP. I think that is very clear. Unfortunately, I think some developing countries feel that mitigation in the bioresource sectors would be a source of finance and technology. India must continue to engage such countries, I think, in a careful dialogue for the future. And I think very importantly, a multidimensional landscape of equity is truly evolving and must be strengthened. Though the multidimensional character of equity has always been acknowledged earlier, uh, but uh, given the lack of emphasis on issues like uh, loss and damage and uh, adaptation the, in uh, the negotiations and the, its uh, overly mitigation-centric focus, equity came to be associated merely with the defensive reactions on mitigation. But I think now we see the evolution of a true multidimensional landscape uh, of uh, equity. And strengthening this and taking this forward is clearly something uh, that uh, developing countries can undertake in the years to come. About mitigation, after 30 years of the convention, it is unfortunately still a fact that the developed world is to convince the rest of the world that it is meeting its commitments. But the claims that they have to success are limited. Their passing the burden to us is uh, very significant. In this uh, process, uh, you know, without their taking the lead urgently, as is their commitment under the convention, and without their putting to work their enormous resources, the world will still continue to be under threat. Uh, I may just say in passing that uh, today, uh, the government is also inaugurating, you know, announcing further measures on, uh, you know, new technological approaches like, uh, carbon capture and storage and so if we you know if the developed world uh, uh, will not meet its commitments uh, what we will be left with is the uh, far out hope of uh, geoengineering and uh, carbon capture and storage uh, i would hope that uh, we would not come to that pass and uh, we can have uh, more progress 
uh, in the years to come. So I'll stop here with apologies to the organizers for uh, extending a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, are you, uh, Mr. Mouskar, are you on the laptop yes, now? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have one question in the chat room, but we have uh, quite a few people perhaps who uh, it would be a shame not to hear from. Um, so let me just see if we can um, invite uh, Mr. Diego Pacheco. He's, uh, if you're here, if you know, we would be grateful if you could make a couple of uh, uh, remarks. Uh, Diego is the, was the head of delegation of uh, Bolivia, uh, lead negotiator uh, and the spokesperson for the like-minded developing countries. Perhaps, perhaps not. Yeah. Maybe okay. Should... Yes, I'll move on. Um, I think. Uh, Else there are, uh, I can also see uh, Navroz. If you're there, if you want to uh, make a few comments, we would be grateful if you can, since you've also followed the process of negotiations fairly closely. Okay. Maybe I have an older list uh, <laughs> of uh, people, and maybe there are just some. <coughs> Issue, but let, let us take the questions then. Um, we have a question from uh, Professor Dadwal. Uh, do we have an estimate of the available fair share of CO2 emission space for India for the next 30, 50 years? Will future planning of emissions be based on CO2 only <coughs> or CO2 plus GHG? Uh, uh, can I just answer that? Sure. I think uh, if you look at the uh, uh, the uh, LTS, as I called it, India's long-term low-carbon development strategy, uh, that has an uh, estimate of uh, the uh, uh, availability of fair share of uh, CO2 emission space uh, but you must remember that there are two issues in answering that. Uh, one is, of course, which temperature limit and under what probability of achieving that limit uh, are we talking about. So it ranges from, say, 50% probability of achieving 1.5 degrees centigrade all the way up to, say, 67 or uh, uh, percent or 50 percent probability of uh, uh, achieving two degrees centigrade. So this is a fairly wide range and it can range. Uh, that is one uh, aspect of it. The second aspect which you have to be careful about is that when you say fair share, uh, would that include uh, what uh, uh, is uh, the total carbon budget only what remains of the carbon budget? So the uh, LTS makes it very clear that uh, the uh, uh, the uh, either and I made it clear also in the talk that this would be compensated uh, either through negative emissions technologies if these truly take off and uh, the freed up carbon space, quote unquote, to the extent possible, should uh, accrue to developing countries, including India. And the other is, this has to be the benchmark for finance and technology transfer. If you want to monify, uh, you want to, if you monetize the carbon debt of developed countries, that provides the benchmark. So. Uh, these are the issues, so you can find the precise numbers. Uh, Akhil, I noticed, has just posted the uh, posted the uh, link for the LTE LEDs, and you'll find the table that summarizes this. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, let me also call uh, uh, Professor Srikant. Uh, he is uh, here or there. He's been a great uh, supporter okay. of our work, a uh, colleague in NIAS and the uh, head of the Energy, Environment and Climate Change Program at NIAS. Okay, thank you, Professor Jaraman, for a very comprehensive uh, and a very, what I would say is uh, um, very, uh, you know, truthful coverage of what has actually happened in uh, COP26. Unfortunately, I find the truth also becomes a casualty when you read various news reports and what people write on the social media and even from people from India who actually attend this uh, uh, COP27 and the previous COPs as well. Uh, only one of the things that, uh, uh, though a lot of, I think, uh, because it was held in Egypt, I think, uh, I think this loss and damage was basically fund was, I think, a major victory. But the only thing what I would like to point out is that uh, this uh, hundred billion dollars per annum, that basically is that a very old commitment which has been there right from the Copenhagen Accord. I think that is something which, though we have been pressing for a long time, it appears that uh, uh, it comes in a, every. Uh, statement that we make, we always say qualify our indices saying that this is subject to basically transfer of technology and you know low cost finance from developed countries. But I think this is something that uh, is yet to see the light of the day and uh, my uh, discussions with uh, you know BHEL or you know uh, the Ministry of Power or you know the DAE who are actually needing this money to implement many of these mitigation uh, technologies. This money is sorely needed. I think uh, that is what I feel the developed countries are just getting away, uh, though they have signed these agreements uh, to provide this money. So do you think that there is any hope that basically something will happen? Uh, the on finance technology transfer? Yes. Yeah, I see uh, uh, the on technology transfer, a point which is uh, being made by several of us, is that the one thing that the pandemic taught us was that, you know, if you put barriers in technology, yeah, you really endanger humanity on a very, you know, quite seriously. So I think uh, uh, in terms of South Africa and India talking about, uh, you know, uh, no barriers for vaccines and lowering IPR, etc. That was a very positive move. They even found some echo briefly from uh, some developed countries, though certainly not all. So I think uh, uh, on technology transfer, I think eventually the idea of cooperative uh, behavior uh, is something that we can progress towards. On finance, really, I I think uh, that uh, we have uh, two tracks to pursue. One thing is, I think we need to keep up the pressure on finance because it is, uh, uh, it is uh, after all, the only thing we can do. That's number one. Second thing is, I think increasingly that, uh, as in the case of loss and damage, etc., eventually uh, their political standing will uh, be affected if they don't deliver. So, you know, so you can't get every time an expression of regret, of grave concern saying you didn't give us the money. You are not keeping your commitment. Uh, so I think uh, this uh, pressure is uh, very critical, is very important. And uh, in the meantime, uh, it does slow down action. Unfortunately, there is no easy way around this. Uh, so uh, we have to see how to uh, improve as best as possible the situation. So even small uh, uh, victories like the call on MDBs to reform their processes is uh, useful. This is not the climate finance architecture that we would ideally like. But yes, it is a useful thing to have and something to push. So that would be my take on it. OK, thank you. Thank you. Let me just also call on uh, uh, Indrajit Bose. Uh, he's from the Third World Network. He's been following the negotiations for a very, very long time. 
and uh, perhaps as a very uh, one of the few people again in the country who is a very comprehensive take across various tracks of the negotiations. So, Indrajit, please happy to hear from you. Thank you so much, Sajal, and uh, thank you to Dr. Jeremy. I'm 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 sorry I joined late. I missed what Moskas uh, what Moskas has said. But uh, just a couple of quick reflections from my end on uh, four key uh, things. I think uh, this COP were, at this COP the G77 and China's unity was exemplary. I think Pakistan led the group really really well uh, in terms of uh, managing. In fact, in, 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 at some points the developed countries were asking during the negotiations, but we want the other subgroups. We want to hear from the other subgroups. So. At that point, the G77 said that no, we will speak as, as one voice. That is what we've decided. And in such instances, the developed countries were actually quite unhappy with the response. Uh, so that was, uh, I think, the COP stood out quite well on on some issues. And it also shows, in some senses, that when the G77 and China can come together and fight on one issue, they do get um, an outcome and agree with all the assessments about whether there will be money, uh, how the money will come, who will pay, all those issues are to be um, resolved. The second thing in my observation was, uh, I think the developed countries onslaught on equity and CBDR across the issues across the board. It, in fact, it felt like uh, Paris all over again. Uh, the, uh, the way they had tried to erase differentiation and not talk about equity when the Paris Agreement was being crafted, I think it was, uh, they had stepped up their onslaught uh, to that levels at this at this point of time. I don't know, maybe because it was, the COP was being hosted in a developing country or what, uh, but uh, I think that was, uh, was, was very key across the rooms. I think the, uh, the third thing is there has been a lot of talk about uh, India advocating for including all phase out of um, unabated fossil fuels uh, <laughs> in the in the in the cover decision as well as the mitigation work program. I think that's only one uh, picking up one aspect of what India said because what India said was either mention none, as in do, do not single out coal, or mention all. So, but then I think the developed countries sort of jumped on the opportunity and they started creating that narrative that India has said um, phasing out or phasing down of all fossil fuels. And that is something that the media picked up also, unfortunately. But this is what I think India had said, and this is um, for the record. Uh, the other thing uh, the other thing that I had is, you know, I read especially a lot of commentary and I heard a lot of commentary in the India following the COP around side events and pavilion spaces and all of that uh, <laughs> that are, uh, that occupy a key space in the COP. I think these are outside of the negotiations and should be treated as just, just that, you know, outside of the negotiations. I don't think the negotiators have the time or the space to uh, even go to these pavilions or side events. And I don't think they take away, uh, it, it, it will not make any difference if we, if we, uh, in the negotiations if these things don't happen. Now, I have a question also to Dr. Jeremy, which is uh, regarding the AR synthesis report coming up in March, I believe. Uh, now, with your, uh, with the work that you've done, and since AR6 uh, synthesis report is supposed to be a compilation at the end of the day, uh, or, so how, how do you how do you see that playing out um, in terms of the three reports being already done, and do we are we expecting to see the same fights that we've had? Uh, in the past, and especially related to scenarios, uh, if you could, if you can uh, talk something about that, thank you. I uh, just very briefly. I'm not going to respond on the synthesis report. I question. I think uh, we look forward to a collegial scientific exchange. Uh, I think uh, uh, you know the willy nilly. Time has passed between uh, the working group two and three approvals and uh, the synthesis report. Uh, people have had time to discuss and reflect. Uh, so I look forward to, shall we say, greater uh, understanding and uh, hopefully we'll produce a report that uh, is balanced uh, all round. Uh, 
uh, answers to both the questions of science, of, uh, of the details, of economic and social processes, uh, of how of what happens in nature with climate change and also answers to the principles and values that are necessary for a safe and livable world and the phrase is the ipcc so and uh, much of what i have drawn on equity has also been drawn from the work of the ipcc so i think we look forward to a collegial and uh, fruitful discussion to produce a report that will do justice to the challenges that face us. Uh, with regard to, uh, you know, you, your expertise in negotiations and following, tracking how statements evolve, I will defer to that in terms of accuracy of what happened. Uh, I think uh, we will uh, continue to face this uh, uh, point and I think you are right uh, that India's point has always been don't cherry pick. Take a balanced view. Take all factors into account. We are with you. Take science into account. And that science, uh, provided it is done appropriately and uh, positively. And I think uh, that uh, continues to be India's stand. That, uh, uh, about 1.5 or 2, you know, the, these are the Paris goals and it depends what the world does, whether it will be 1.5 or 2. I can't be 1 point, keep 1.5 alive, cannot be uh, any particular group of countries' responsibility. It simply doesn't work like that. And so that is also our basis, not an opposition to 1.5. Uh, but uh, we are agnostic because the world has to act, not agnostic because we don't believe that 1.5 would be better. You know, So I think uh, uh, the point going forward and uh, from uh, India's view has always stood us in good stead is don't cherry pick, take a balanced view uh, and uh, reflect uh, the principles and values of the convention. I think... Uh, uh, Mr. Mosker will agree that this uh, uh, has always been the mantra of the Indian delegation and continues to be so. Uh, yes. Let me, I think Navroz can uh, work the uh, speaker now. So let me call Navroz Dubash uh, from the Center for Policy Research. Uh, since we ended the note on IPCC, he's also one of the authors of the Working Group 3 report of the IPCC. So, Navroz, please, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel. Sorry, I'm not as familiar with Teams and I'm on a phone, so I was fumbling a bit. Um, uh, so, thank you and thank you to Mr. Mosker. Thank you to Dr. Jeraman. Professor Jeraman, uh, as, as usual, uh, very lucid and, and very comprehensive. Uh, so, I won't take a, a, a very long, just three or four uh, uh, maybe uh, observations and a question. Um, one is it's it's uh, it's it's good to hear that uh, um, uh, in your work you found various things to draw on coming out of the IPCC, and I do think that there has been a an effort uh, uh, to across various chapters to take uh, uh, the implications of equity more seriously. Of course, there's ongoing debate about, in particular, whether that is done and whether how that works in the scenarios, and and you have written about that. Uh, but I think that certainly across many of the chapters, uh, that's something that was uh, uh, that was uh, the authors uh, strove uh, to do, and and several things that you picked up, I, I agree with. Um, I want to touch on this fossil fuel phase out uh, 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 language as opposed to coal. I actually think this was a really important um, uh, 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 effort by India, continuing on from from Glasgow to say, look, you know. Uh, we shouldn't really be privileging uh, 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 one or another fossil fuel. And in fact, one could go further in that articulation. I think we should go further to say, if we have to keep some measure of fossil fuels in the ground uh, uh, in order to keep to 1.5 or 2 degrees, then we, there is a correlated question, which is whose carbon should be burnable? And the basis for that decision should not be based on the carbon content of that fuel or the, the dirtiness of the fuel, but it should be, be based on where that fuel has the greatest welfare gains. And that is an argument that really one can uh, pursue 
And I think we should pursue that if there's scarce burnable fossil fuels, then it should be used where its welfare gains are, are, are greatest. And that is actually the problem with sort of the least cost approach. It assumes that the least cost approach translates seamlessly over to welfare. But actually, if you care about welfare, we should focus directly on welfare, not indirectly on it, as is purported to be done through, through least cost. So that's, I think, an interesting conversation uh, one can take forward. I agree with a lot of what has been said on, on finance. I think, I think that's a conversation that is kind of opening up, uh, a conversation that was not had at Sharm al-Sheikh, but will undoubtedly come back, is the conversation on 21C on the so-called sort of mainstream of finance. And that's something that I think uh, uh, over the course of the next year, one must deepen conversations on. Uh, it will be probably, uh, 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 you know, also tied to the conversation around uh, the MDPs, which I do think is a productive conversation. Uh, so that is sort of an area, a blind spot in a sense as of now, uh, uh, and it's not it's not going away, but that's something on which productive work, I think, will need to be uh, uh, done in India, uh, thinking about what our uh, thought process is there. Finally, on the LTS, I just had a couple of uh, observations and, and, and of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, broadly agree with uh, the characterization. Just want to add two things uh, to it, uh, uh, or three things, perhaps. One is that, uh, 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 you know, for good reason, there was no sort of scenarios built in and quantitative estimates and so on and so forth uh, for a range of reasons. And I agree with those uh, with those reasons. But that is going to be sort of a, an agenda for the future that has to be dealt with very, very carefully. And I worry a little bit about uh, uh, people trying to do scenarios that go out to 2070, because that is just so far in the future where you're making a lot of guesses uh, on technology costs and so on. And, and, and we've already seen some modeling studies. Uh, CPR has an initiative where we try and unpack these modeling studies. And I, I worry about the certainty with which uh, some groups are putting out some of these numbers, given that, in fact, it is an inherently unknowable thing. Uh, it's like trying to project in 1970 what 2020s, uh, 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 the world's 2020 energy future looks like. You know, it's, it's just as difficult for 50 years into the future. But that's one aspect. Uh, the, the second um, aspect is that, uh, just to embellish what uh, Professor Jairaman said, I think the, the particular categories of development transitions very usefully lay out five or six or seven areas of transition, which could actually form the fulcrum for conversations uh, of different epistemic communities, different sort of policy communities, and so on. I think that's a useful uh, breaking down of the problem that the, the, the study did. And the final point where I perhaps will, uh, and this won't be a surprise, uh, will, will differ slightly from Professor Jaraman, is in the, he said that uh, the the framing of the equity challenge and the development transition as it's in the report are two sides <laughs> of the same coin. And I'm not sure that that's, I entirely agree with that. I certainly agree that equity has to be the basis of how we go about this. But the, uh, but the forward looking trajectory on equity to my mind in India is, here is what it takes to achieve a development transition in a low carbon direction. Here is the needs that we have in technology capacity finance, the means of implementation, and the framing of equity should therefore be around how those needs uh, are, are provided. And the more precise we can be about that, the stronger uh, the, the case uh, uh, that we can put forward. The slight issue I have with the abstraction, so I agree that the carbon budget as a way of understanding responsibility for the past is completely right. The carbon budget as a way of having a conversation about the future has the problem, and this is a pragmatic problem, that we will spend a long time deciding on that allocation. And here's where I also have a slight difference. In terms of the shift from the language of mitigation to development, I don't think we should be drawing a very clear line in, this, in the following sense. I think that future development trajectories are going to have to internalize mitigation. I don't think we necessarily have to think of mitigation as a dirty word here. We can't, because if we don't address mitigation, we are going to suffer impacts and India is going to be among the most vulnerable. So that kind of trying to draw a bright line between those two, I actually think the LTS does a good job of showing how the two have to be brought together. And that framing to my mind is how we should be uh, uh, thinking about this. This is something that uh, Jairam and I have disagreed about for many uh, uh, moons, so it's not going to be resolved uh, today. But I will put on the table one thing. The table that he pointed to, table 
which for example and this is the illustrates the challenge to my mind of being very explicit about a carbon budget allocation story uh uh uh, uh ex ante allocation says that for a 1.5 degree 67 probability world the carbon budget is about 400 india's fair share including historical responsibility which we have always claimed is 441 gigatons out of 400 in other words more than 100% now when we are in a world where we are also working with allies if india comes to the table with that sort of starting position that not only do we want 100% of the budget and there has been negative emissions enough to allo- to meet our fair share and the rest of the developing world that gets us into a conversation that could be very fraught so i want to draw a distinction here if we are using this as a tactical position in order to sort of open up the space i think that's fine if we are thinking about this as a as a starting point of a negotiation i think we need to come to the table yeah. saying i uh, fair enough german it's uh, I, i i will i'll stop i thought i was uh, explaining this point but uh, no, clearly no, 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 but, uh, but but uh, just, i'm not going to I, i'm not going to respond uh, to that point it's, uh, except to say that uh, the uh, the question uh, of whether this is uh, physically to be accessed is something that has been clarified in the ltr now you know it is the government's document so the government in its wisdom has chosen on some language i seem okay with that uh, i am fine with that language maybe others or not so that's one thing the second thing is i think uh, giving notice that free riding is not on so what bothers me in a non carbon budget framing is that every proactive action that you take is and you say you know mitigation is not separate it's all part of development every proactive action is uh, slowing down uh, this thing so you know uh, the us uh, signs the biggest oil and gas deal uh, lease deal in its history uh, the uk energy security exhorts the uk oil and gas industry to go to the north sea again and will fuel less for the future and in the meantime here we say oh boy all of us will do electric vehicles no but that's uh, it's a bit of a problem there no on free riding so my concern is uh, a good measure to ensure that free riding does not take place can then open up a conversation on allocation finally there is by no means i read the government of india's uh, statement Uh, in the lts as that the government is going tomorrow to go and say let us discuss how much each one gets of the carbon budget that's not the point we are basically saying as far as i can read it that you are not going to get free riding and you are going to have to do your share and that i am not going to pick up the pieces for the disaster you caused and that's about it as far uh, as i want to say on that uh the other thing i agree on scenarios i think we need uh, this thing my problem is uh, also with the welfare type of calculation unless you build a distributive transfers of a massive scale into the welfare framework as opposed to a leak cost framework it will still end up giving the same result if welfare optimization works on with pareto optimality then that's as good as i'd rather do good old grandfathering uh, on a piece of paper on the back of an envelope you know so i would just say that uh, we need to see what are the welfare gains and uh, how these welfare gains are measured what is the role of uh, monetizing you know uh putting economic value on health and you know there are all these uh, factors which go into welfare uh, calculation so i would be uh, agnostic but certainly you know one could look at all possibilities we have done 20 years of least cost so i wouldn't mind if somebody does uh, you know uh, uh, welfare based uh, 
calculation. So, so that would be fine. So that's it. And I, I agree, you know, we have disagreed on this uh, over the years and perhaps we will continue to do so. Right. Thanks for chipping in anyway. Thanks for uh, speaking up. Right. Um, any other? All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Navroz. And I think we are, uh, we, if there are any more questions, perhaps we can take. Otherwise, I'm going to hand over to uh, Mr. Mauskar. Uh, the, the reason I was moderating this is because he was having some difficulty with the with the device that he was using in looking at who was raising hands, etc. But I will hand over to him for his, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, concluding remarks, as well as uh, if he wants to uh, sort of also ask uh, uh, Jairaman some questions. <laughs> no, <laughs> Please, I think uh, the, clock, the clock is preempting me, yeah. but uh, I'll make uh, three, four very quick points. See, one is the world will continue to face challenges and changes, expected or unexpected, like who expected Corona or the Ukraine imbroglio. Now, uh, countries, developing countries, and India is one, uh, will be well advised to stick to the basis, equity. Uh, national circumstances is a phrase which since Paris uh, Agreement has uh, come up a lot, and I see that uh, the covered decision both in Glasgow and in Sharmar Sheikh are peppered with the uh, national circumstances. Now, that is something we need to look at. Uh, I had written a paper, uh, Tejal, maybe you can put a link somewhere, on what are the national imperatives for India, where we take into account what is the natural endowment, what are the civilizational imperatives, what are the development challenges. And I guess that kind of thinking is already there in the long term, uh, that low carbon path of India to 2070. Second is this you know, question of intra and intergenerational equity. One reason why in your paper, uh, you and Professor Jairaman found that uh, the uh, IPCC scenarios uh, per continue to perpetuate the inequity is that we are not talking of intra-generation equity. I mean, if uh, my uh, Indian grandchild will be as rich as Indian grandfather, and so with the US grandchild and grandfather, the inequity will never go away. So uh, how do you bring in the intra-generation equity is something which needs to be looked at. Now, India is going to be chair of G20. So we'll have to do a very fine balancing act between uh, the chair of G20 and the UNFCC negotiations, we always used to say that the climate negotiations, the only forum or the premier forum is the uh, uh, UNFCC COP. Now, that is another challenge which I can see for next one year India has to handle. And this IPCC six assessment, this synthesis report, because between the three working groups, uh, as you are aware, and uh, many of our listeners may be aware, there are discrepancies bound to happen in scientific work, especially spanning hard sciences like physics and soft sciences like okay, economics or social uh, sociology. Now, this will be uh, interesting to know what the IPCC synthesis report, how does it resolve these challenges? Now, uh, two more small points. One is, these are all my personal views. I'm not talking either for the government, which I left long ago, and ORF, which with who, which I'm still associated, and I must congratulate uh, Nias for organizing this interesting discussion and, and enabling me to participate, and uh, hoping that for COP28 again we'll have a similar meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Master. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mauskar, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Jairaman, uh, for the talk. I think it was, uh, like many of the participants said, it was quite comprehensive. I also uh, thank you, uh, uh, Navroz, Indrajit, uh, and uh, Srikant for your comments. Uh, it, I think you know, we were, um, the, the entire point was to have uh, an exchange of views and uh, discussion on what are the what all of us think are key elements going forward. Uh, I think it is quite clear that the challenges are significant. Uh, the challenges also in terms of uh, what those outside of the formal negotiation processes would do. I think one of the key issues of, uh, I, I mean, differences in the way in which the COPs happen uh, is that 
it involves so many different uh, actors. It's not the governments, of course, are involved in the formal negotiations and uh, uh, discussions, but civil society, uh, academia, uh, media, all of these play a very important role, not always necessarily positively, uh, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, it's not a discussion. It's a discussion that happens across many uh, different sections of society, I think is a useful thing. So um, again, thank you very much. Let me end with this and perhaps uh, we can have many more such discussions. Let I want to make a quick announcement. Uh, Jairaman, uh, as well as Mr. Mouskar, and in fact, some others also referred to our work on the IPCC scenarios. It is ongoing work and we have updated uh, some of the results from uh, what we had presented uh, uh, at COP27, uh, the paper and the paper that is still available online. Uh, we will be holding a webinar on the 8th of, uh, of uh, November. So that is next week on the IPCC scenarios. Uh, we will circulate the details of that webinar uh, and uh, the schedule for it shortly. Uh, but we would invite all of you to please join in uh, to that webinar. Uh, and uh, we would be happy to get your comments and feedback on that work. Uh, so with this, let me also thank again, once again, my uh, institute uh, and all the support that it always gives for uh, such events. Uh, and also uh, all of uh, our, our colleagues from both NIAS and MSSRF uh, who are, you know, collaborators and contributors to this. Uh, so thank you very much. With this, I'm uh, officially closing the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.